You, you, you are now listening to the Project Kuwait. To the Project Kuwait. To the Project Kuwait. Where we stop at nothing to bring you the right facts on health, fitness, and psychology. Featuring some of the world's most experienced professionals. Profession. So you can learn, lift, and win. With your hosts, Meg, Dr. D, and Mandy. Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of The Project, and I get to sit down and talk to Mark Bunn out of Australia, and he is an Ayurvedic medicine expert, and we dive deep into Ayurvedic medicine. He talks about longevity, he talks about recovery, some of the keys to consciousness, and what some athletes are not doing or putting into their regimes. And towards the end of the episode, he reveals a forgotten herb that we have not been taking and maybe you should listen to and try it out so with that said don't forget to leave us a rating and review all this and more in today's episode Hey, everybody. I'd like to welcome to the show Mark Bunn. He has an interesting, diverse background. And I mean, dude, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I have, you know, you've got so much under your belt that I think you could probably do a way better job than me, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but I think everyone's got an interesting journey in life. I started as a professional footballer in Australia, which uh, is a bit of a combination of American gridiron, soccer, and basketball, but we don't have the padding. So what a lot of people really find interesting with Australian football is we still have the tackling and running at full speed, but we have no no helmets, no padding. So it's it's pretty full on, but it's very aerobic as well and quite skillful. So it's a good game. It's rugby, right? Like is it or do you is it a different version? It's actually not rugby, no. So we have there's obviously rugby league, rugby union, but Australian rules football is you kick the ball. So as in soccer, it's not a round ball. It's an oval ball, so it bounces all over the place. But unlike rugby, you can handball the ball. So you use a hand so you don't throw it. There's a lot of kicking, and it's it's a full field. It's a bigger field than rugby, so it's very aerobic. Players run about 15 to 20 kilometers per game in two hours. And you can jump on people's back. They, If you watch YouTube and you watch um, videos – you go for the spectacular mark. So you'll see players jumping on people's backs to take a high mark or a catch, that sort of thing. So yeah, and that was my background before I got into sort of sports science and then eventually into uh, Eastern medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. That, that's amazing. And you've written a few books too, um, Ancient Wisdom for the Modern Health. I mean, now, why don't you talk about your books a little bit? I, honestly, I, I didn't have time between the setup of the interviews and usually I try to get a hold of these uh, soft copies. But why don't you tell us a little bit about your books? I'm, I'm truly fascinated by the title of that book, to be honest with you. Yeah, well, it's an interesting background because I started in Western health science. I did exercise physiology. And at the end of that study, which was great, it was really good information, but every week or every month, it seemed like there was a new study coming out from Harvard or Yale or Stanford telling us something different about sports science and performance. And it was very confusing to me. And I was meant to be teaching others what to do. And then in 1990, in my first year as a professional athlete, I got taught something called transcendental meditation, which has an Eastern tradition to it. And it has a science around it, which is Ayurvedic medicine, a very ancient traditional system of healthcare that I looked into and started to study. And it just that moment where the light bulb goes on and it had all this wisdom of it's not just what you eat, but you've got to eat according to an individual body type, exercise regimes change according to body types, this daily cycle that it's not just what you eat or when you exercise, how much sleep, but when you do that. And it just really complemented beautifully and broadened my sort of Western science understanding. So the whole journey from then has been taking all these ancient wisdoms, you know, these cultures throughout the world that have lived for thousands of years in harmony with natural law and have had very little incidence of cancers and heart disease and et cetera, et cetera, what principles they've lived on and abided by for thousands of years, how we can practically integrate those into a modern Western world and a sort of business climate and that sort of thing. So that's what ancient wisdom for modern health is, embracing the the time-tested wisdoms that have been around forever, but putting them in a practical context that we we need to live with uh, these days. I honestly, I think that's amazing. And, and to be honest with you, I think people neglect 
the stuff that's worked for thousands and thousands of years. I mean, you just look at, I think they're called the blue zones or the blue zone countries, like uh, certain places in Japan where people are living till 104. And it's like, yes, their diets are normal. They don't do anything crazy. It's just kind of rice, fish, and plenty of greens and whatever. But I think the one key that people forget is the movement and purpose of life also. Because I think it's Okinawa, Japan. It's Okinawa, if I'm not mistaken. They live to about 100, 405. And these guys are 90 years old, still diving and catching fish and doing crazy stuff. And the purpose of life makes a huge difference. I saw it with my great grandmother when she got afraid, when she started to have this fear of going down the stairs, that's when her health started to dwindle away. From your experience, why we neglect this ancient wisdom so much? Well, we've obviously come into a world that is based on science. We believe that unless you can prove something scientifically, then the jury's out, which, and there's a certain truth to this. And so what we fail to realize is that science is not just looking at something under a microscope or petri dish and doing double blind studies on. Science is really finding the truth of life, it's getting to that essence. And if something has worked, for hundreds and if not thousands of years, year after year in different populations, then that also is scientific investigation. They call it time-tested science. And so I think I'm not always totally negative, but I think our pharmaceutical industry, it's such a money-making and highly invested industry that money talks, as they say. And so I think it's that sort of division between good science and maybe science we do because we want to sell a product that has muddied the waters somewhat. But I think, and COVID-19 actually has been a really interesting time. And I think it's a big transition in the world consciousness where many cultures throughout the world are now coming back to embracing these more simple wisdoms of just natural, locally grown food. And what you sort of touched on with that diet, it's nothing amazing. It's just simple food. But the other two big things with these long living cultures that distinguishes them from our high disease cultures is the sense of community. So it's around, as you said, purpose, but purpose within a, a community and a collective so that that family environment is fundamental. And also the way they view the elderly. Many countries today, it's we're very youth obsessed. It's all about trying to be younger and get rid of your wrinkles and use Botox, which in terms of a mind-body medicine perspective creates internal stress because aging is inevitable. You can't not get older. But these other cultures, the older you get, the more venerated, the more loved, the more respected for your wisdom you are by your community. So it sets up a whole different way of aging and living well. So yeah, interesting. I love that point because we were just recording an episode a couple of weeks ago, me and Dr. D, and someone yeah. had asked me, why don't you dye your beard? And I was like, there's a <laughs> wisdom in the white hair. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I feel that every white hair I get on my face and on my head had to yes. do with a crisis that I overcame. And there's wisdom in that. And there's love for myself in that also. And I love that yes. point that you brought up of how people should kind of embrace the aging of it. And if you were to have like one takeaway or give one takeaway to people from that aspect, what would it be about aging? I would say it is, well, it's stress. Underlying all those things I've mentioned, the central point is stress. There's a saying, you know, stress is the biggest killer. We talk about we want to eat good food and naturally grown food and organic and we want to exercise and we want to enjoy our work. All these things basically is the body in a state of comfort, ease, enjoyment, bliss, which is our natural state. As little babies, you see a baby born, unless there's been significant birthing trauma, babies by nature are happy. You know, they, dad or mom goes up and does a silly face and they laugh and they giggle. And, and so it's stress. It's only stress that limits our human capacity and capability. So in all these things, lack of community which we see very much in around the world today. And American Psychological Association tells us that loneliness and um, isolation are bigger killers than heart disease and all these sort of things. So community is massive. And again, as you said, purpose in life. In Ayurvedic medicine or the Vedic tradition, they call it dharma. Dharma is not just our passion that we talk about a lot, 
you know, doing your passion, what you love, which is important, but there's a bigger perspective and it's not just what you like to do, but in a sense, what your duty is, that everyone is born on this planet to fulfill a duty or a purpose. That's why we're born. That's our dharma. And so living in tune with our dharma is where we live the most stress-free life. And that's where we have like a frictionless flow to life and the body doesn't age in that state as much as when everything's a grind and we hate our job and we're counting down the minutes to the you know, end of the work day or in a toxic relationship or all these sort of things. So um, yeah, stress is the big one. If we can just try and manage our life in ways that we reduce the stress and just live like nature. Nature is winter to autumn to summer. There's a flow to it. There's a transition and it just, as Lao Tzu once said, it just nature has its own flow. There's no stress in it. We create the stress from our side. So that's the big one, I think. That makes sense. But what do you say to people that do live with, I mean, I have a minor in psych and I have a pretty deep psychology background. I told you we have psyched with Dr. D also, but there are people, and me and Dr. D have discussed that, that live for stress. They live for these stressful yeah. situations and <clears throat> that's their purpose in life. And it's like, sometimes when you take away that stress, they lose their purpose. So what would you say to yeah. people like that? I mean, you know, how do you find that happy balance with the opposite side of it? Yeah, no, I, that's a great point. And both of them can be there. It's like the paradox of life. You know, there's, it's there's yin all and yang, possibilities. So to speak. Correct. And so when this idea of dharma, comparing dharma as opposed to passion. So your point, when we talk about passion, we often think this, it's always enjoyable and we're always loving it. And, you know, time flies. But dharma is the bigger purpose in life. And so Joan of Arc or Abraham Lincoln or these people endured amazing stress, you know, hardship, adversity, but that was part of their bigger purpose. So I think the key is not whether you have the stress or not, but it's whether you're going through it with the eye on that you're fulfilling a bigger purpose. If that's there, and, a lot of, and you'd be better than me to know, but the psychological studies suggest that if there's the bigger purpose there, then you can endure great hardship and adversity versus the person who's just mired in the stress without sort of seeing the bigger picture to their, their life or serving some other purpose. Yeah, I think it's that, that subjective aspect to it's really important. Oh, that's awesome. I totally get that. And that makes a lot of sense. Now let's shift gears a little bit to talking about Ayurvedic medicine. What is mm. that exactly for our listeners? I think you're the first person that specializes in Ayurvedic medicine on our show. So can you talk about that a little bit, sort of a general overview for the listeners? You know, what is it exactly? I mean, to be honest with you, I know the just about it. And one yeah. of the guys at work has always been like, dude, you should try this. You should try this. So I looked into it, but I never got around to it. So can you talk about it a little bit? Cool. Yeah. Well, there's two levels to Ayurveda. I would like the first one is what many people understand Ayurveda. And that is that it's a traditional system of healthcare. The World Health Organization calls it the longest continuous system of healthcare in the world. Its roots we're in India, what they call Vedic India. So for many thousands of years, this traditional system of healthcare. The deeper level or the deeper understanding of Ayurveda is it's not connected to India per se. It is the understanding of the fundamental laws of nature or the laws of life. So in our universe, there's certain laws that govern everything. The seasons come at certain times, the planets revolve around the sun, a baby's born and it grows in a certain system or an order. There's an intelligence to the way the world works. And so Ayurveda is the knowledge of that intelligence. And so that expresses in everything from the seasons to the daily cycle. So in Ayurveda, they understand that what we do at different times of the day is in many ways more important than just what we do in terms of calories or fats or example. Body types is a huge understanding in Ayurveda that no exercise regime or stress management regime or diet is suitable for every individual. Everyone has a unique constitution that some will need, you know, higher fat diet, some will need more spices, some will need etc. And so it's really the literal translation or definition is science of life. 
And in its broadest aspect, it connects with what they call Vedic science in terms of astrology, how planets influence our health, how the buildings we live in and work in influence our health, but right through to everything from herbs to diet to exercise to you name it. So yeah, it's very broad, very ancient. And when we really understand it, we know that it's an eternal science of life because the laws of nature have been around forever. You know, gravity has always been here. Just because Isaac Newton discovered it a few hundred years ago doesn't mean uh, it hasn't always been here. So yeah, that's the general understanding. That's so true. And uh, what I love is you talk about the cycles and I talk about it a lot about circadian rhythm to people and understanding our circadian rhythm and waking up when the sun comes up and going to sleep when the sun goes down. And I was actually talking to my wife a few days ago when we were on one of our walks here in Kuwait and no one was out. And I was like, you know what? I think our Arab circadian rhythm was built upon doing things at night because it is so hot Mm. in the day. You know, I mean, Kuwait in the middle of the summer, it gets up to about 120 degrees, which is 56 degrees. So that's pretty damn hot, you know, and I can imagine, (laughs) I can't imagine our ancestors saying, Hey, all right, let's take a camel back and travel a (laughs) hundred kilometers. So I would assume a lot of their traveling happened at night back then. What would you think of that? Just being with your line of expertise? That's a beautiful point. And the circadian rhythm and circadian medicine is fantastic. And this is the beautiful mirror between ancient and modern. You know, so Ayurveda has spoken about this for thousands of years. Modern medicine has circadian medicine. We now have personalized medicine, which is this whole idea of body types. But what you're talking about is laws of nature. So what we know is that there are fundamental, universal, eternal laws of nature, gravity, the seasons, etc. And then sort of as an expression of those, we have individual laws of nature or localized laws of nature. So obviously, as you're saying, in Arab countries, the seasons and the weather is completely different to North America or somewhere else in the world. So every country and every location in the world has its own unique laws of nature that will vary what the appropriate um, daily regime is for that location. And that will change, obviously, with the time of year. And then beyond that also, we individuals also have our own individual laws of nature, which is our body type, you know, our own personality, our own digestive strengths or weaknesses, our own habituation to certain foods that we also have to take into account. So it's all these levels that comprise Ayurveda. It's a really good point to distinguish. I love one of the points that you talked about now, and I I hope you can discuss this a little bit. The more modern we have become and the more science has grown, we have evolved to the point where we can essentially plant and harvest vegetables that weren't harvested during the winter, (laughs) during the summer. And there are some summer vegetables, and I've read a lot about this in the past. What's your take on it that you know, you're not supposed to be eating watermelon in Christmas. You know what I mean? Like, like it wasn't meant to be eaten in Christmas. And there have been some anecdotal studies that have said, you know, like when you eat certain vegetables that weren't harvested at that time, it doesn't react well with your body and it throws off your system. So what's your take on that? Well, I thank you for the question because I love this question. My partner and I, we were talking about it at lunch today. She's from America. And it was a lunchtime discussion. It's a perfect example of this movement away from nature and natural law. So there's a great story that is a prelude to this. In America, about 25 years ago, there was an Ayurvedic doctor, they're called Vijas, and he was brought to America to give consultations to the um, in New York, I think it was. And he was picked up from the airport and he was driving into town and they were stopped at a traffic light. And he looked out his window, and in between the concrete side strip, the nature, uh, the sidewalk, there was a little, like a weed growing up between. And he turned to the taxi driver and he said, oh, a lot of people have asthma here. And the taxi driver didn't know what he was talking about. So said, what do you mean? He says, yes, there's a huge problem with asthma in this city, but how do you know that? And he says, because that weed, which he recognized, was the medicine for asthma. In Ayurveda, they understand every plant, every tree, every weed, in a sense, has a medicinal value. And so nature grows what is needed for the laws of nature that is surrounding it or the imbalances in that. And so the reason I use that example is because certain foods 
grow in certain locations around the world because that's what the people in that location at that time need. If you take a goji berry from India, which is a great food, it's high in antioxidants, and when you study it under a microscope, fantastic. And when you take that goji berry and you freeze it and then you put it in the back of a truck and you send it thousands of kilometers and you put it on a plane and you send it to Kuwait or Australia or somewhere else, then it has a completely different effect. And Ayurveda has the understanding of prana. Prana is essentially life force or the chi energy. And this is absolutely key. And once you start taking a food out of its natural environment, in a sense, then you disturb the prana or the life force. So yes, you can analyze it under a microscope and it's got this nutrient or this macronutrient, but the essential essence of the food, which is the the life force it gives, is not always the same. So uh, really good point you've made. I love that you bring that up because in Kuwait, we've seen an increase in asthma and we've seen an increase in obesity and a lot of different things. And I have a strong belief that there is a correlation between the Western food people here have been introduced to over the last, I'd say, 25 years. Now, how can we find a balance between modern nutrition and ancient nutrition? Well, it's a really tough one, to be honest with you. What I've actually found personally over a number of years, and I had a wife who passed away from breast cancer quite a number of years ago. Sorry to hear that. No, thank you. But the big lesson for me was, and she was quite healthy. You know, when we met, she meditated, she went to bed reasonably early, lived in tune with the cycles. She understand a little bit about Ayurveda, but there was a, a certain aspect of her life that there was a high stress component to it. And that was what I mentioned earlier. Your stress really is the biggest killer. So the framework I like to use is we do live in a modern world. It is really tough, sometimes impossible to have the perfect diet in inverted commas with perfectly grown natural food. I suggest when it comes to diet, no stress is ideal. You know, so try and just take, we take on so much stress in terms of food. You know, I've got to have everything organic or it's going to be fresh, eat sitting down and it's just not possible. So I think we do the best we can and then overlaying that, we just little little step. Everything's about gradual changes, particularly if it's a lot of highly processed foods. I think that's science is showing that's one of our key factors in our sort of journey towards higher disease rates. So I think just trying to get it as fresh as we can, but just that whole environment of eating. You know, I'm at my sister's house tonight. We've had nine people, you know, got the family and it's, you know, people are laughing and it's joking. And I think that's the real essence of food and eating. Whether the food's 80% healthy, that's great. 90% fantastic, but don't try and get it perfect. Live the life you have to live and uh, see the bigger picture and and just try and uh, keep the stress down. That's a great point. And I tell people all the time, like, I'm a CrossFitter. I'm 37 yeah. years old. It wasn't the ideal time to pick it up two years ago, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was a baseball coach, certified sports, all that stuff. But one thing about exercise and nutrition and sleep and everything, and I was trying to explain this because I also have a full-time job. I work behind a desk. And there are certain balances that we have to make and certain choices we have to make in life. You might have to forego the nutrition side to make up for the exercise. And what would you advise on that? Because my take has always been, I know if I'm moving more, if I'm exercising and putting my body through an adequate amount of stress physically because I sit behind a desk all day, then I'm probably, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, getting more benefit out of that and sacrificing a little bit on the nutrition side. So would you say it's more of an individualistic thing? I mean, what would you say for that? And then I have a follow-up question in regards to exercise. Well, I love the question because what came to me is basically the essence of Ayurvedic medicine. The essence of Ayurveda is our bodies are infinitely intelligent by nature. That in any moment of the day, our bodies are giving us feedback in terms of how much food we need, what food we need, how much exercise, how much rest, when to go to sleep. But it's just that in our modern world, there is so much information overload. There's so much technology. There's so many experts telling us to do this and this and this, and it's impossible to do all of it. So Ayurveda has what's called self-referral wisdom, which is if we actually stop 
and actually listen to our body. What do I mean by listen to our body? We just close the eyes or we shut off all the other experts and the body will tell us what it needs. And yes, that will be completely different from one person to the next. And it will be different at one stage of our life to another stage or even one day to the next. So that's a perfect example. You're sitting down at the desk on your work days versus someone else who maybe is a laborer and they're outdoors on the tool. So what you need in terms of exercise is going to be completely different. And your body is telling you, I need to focus more on exercise rather than having the perfect diet, whereas someone else, it might be different. We can't tell you that from a scientific experiment or a you know, double-blind study. Only your body can tell you. And that's a beautiful example that everyone's different go with what the body's telling you and it'll be different from day to day, month to month. And that's really the wisest course. I love you brought up an important point that I've stressed on the show and on my Instagram profile. And I've talked about it in length about some people, especially with the new craze around the two hottest things I think in the fitness industry right now. One is intuitive eating, which everyone seems to be throwing around as a buzzword. You know, they're like, oh, I eat intuitively. (laughs) Dude, you're like 25 years old. You don't know what intuitive is yet. The other one is intermittent fasting. So intuitive eating, I'm 37. And it has taken me literally 37 years to figure my body out in every week, every three weeks, every year, it changes. You know, when I was 34, I could eat chicken. I was fine eating chicken. Now if I eat chicken, I retain water. I feel groggy. I just feel like crap. So I had to switch to beef. And, you know, it's like gluten. Right now, gluten has an adverse effect. (laughs) And I'm learning these things as I go along. And when people tell me, oh, I eat intuitively, I'm like, dude, you don't even know what intuitive means. So (laughs) can you talk about, (laughs) I'm sure you've heard it over in Australia too, you know, like, can you talk about that craze that's been going around and how hard and important it is to understand your body and sort of how to gauge things in a smart way and not just think of the calorie count or just think of the macro count that's going in? Yeah, it's a fabulous point. And it's, I've been through the same journeys. I'm laughing along with you. Probably the final piece to the puzzle to this in Ayurveda is it's the understanding of what we call consciousness. And so I always have the analogy of a tree. You want to grow the tree so it's strong and it's healthy and it's robust and it's got beautiful fruit and flowers. But what we know is that the tree is not nourished by watering the different branches. You can race around all day, stressing out, watering all the branches and the leaves, and the tree will die because you actually haven't watered the roots, and the roots lie underground. You can't see the roots unless you dig under. And so in Ayurveda, one of my meditation teachers, Mahashi Mahesh Yogi, has this great analogy, and he says, water the root to enjoy the fruit. And so he's the one that taught transcendental meditation, and that's like this complement to what we're all talking about. And so your point in answer in a long-winded way to your point, it comes back to this self-referral. Well, how do we know what's right for us and how do we develop that? The Ayurvedic way to do that is through transcendence or transcending. Transcend means to go beyond. So what do we go beyond? We go beyond the active, busy, agitated, turbulent mind that many of us go through each day. If we can settle the mind down, to its natural state, which is calm, steady, silent, like the bottom of the ocean rather than the turbulent waves at the top of the ocean, then that is where we get the insight, the clarity about, yes, this is the diet that's most suitable to me. This is the type of exercise I need at this time. It's like the classic analogy of the the relationship breakup. You know, there's some massive emotional stress in our life. You know, our partners just walked out on us or some financial collapse, then the next morning you can guarantee we're sitting around empty pizza boxes and beer bottles, (laughs) you know, because it's stress. So if we can minimize or reduce that, then we get that self-referral status naturally. And we're just that insight or that clarity just comes over time that we begin to know exactly what's right for our body type, even though the latest scientific study or the, the Harvard expert might tell us something else. That's a great answer. And 
I love it because it's just finding the root of the problem. That's amazing. Now let's dive into a little bit on the fitness side of things because we have a lot of listeners that are in the fitness craze and CrossFitters, coaches, and so forth. And we talk a lot about recovery, 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 recovery is like the key. Now yeah. you were an ex footballer. And you have your expertise in Ayurvedic medicine. So what are some of the perfect storms for recovering the body due to a tremendous amount of stress? We have CrossFitters, powerlifters, bodybuilders, you name it, we got it listening to this show. So what could you give from the Ayurvedic medicine side that could help these athletes better their recovery? I know you've already had so many experts in this space. This space. So I'm going to go for something quite left field. That's what I was hoping Ayurveda for, man. That's new. definitely yeah. what I was hoping for. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go really left field here. So Ayurveda, and this is going to resonate, I think, with some of your listeners, but it probably is not really going to truly resonate for another 10 or 20 years when they get to their late 30s or their 40s or hitting 50. <laughs> but from an Ayurvedic perspective, and I'm telling them this from personal ex- experience, you know, as a professional athlete in my 20s, I really pushed my body to its limits. I was studying free radicals. I did um, antioxidant supplements as my thesis when I was studying back in the research days. But from an Ayurvedic perspective, they have a completely 100% diametrically opposed viewpoint on exercise. And that is that exercise is designed to create perfect mind-body integration. That's the purpose. Because the purpose of life in a Ayurvedic perspective is to evolve to higher states of consciousness. We're here to live a healthy, vibrant, happy, successful life. And the best way to do that is when mind and body are in perfect harmony. That's what yoga means. Yoga is union, union of mind and body. And so stress is a barrier or an obstacle to complete mind, body, integration. And so a zone state for the athletes out there and baseballers, you know, get in the zone. If you're a pitcher or a um, batter, you can't miss. Or a runner who just, you know, gets in the zone and it's like their legs don't touch the ground. They're just our highest performances in any sport, tennis, baseball, golf, the best performances are the ones that correlate with the least amount of stress. Let me repeat that. The least amount of stress. Mind and body are in perfect harmony. We're in the flow state. The ball just bounces the right way. We know two moves ahead of the game. And so if we keep incurring incredible stress into our nervous system and physiology year after year, yes, we can build a bigger muscle in the short term or run a faster, you know, 1K time trial, but we're actually incurring more and more stress over time. And so Ayurveda comes from the complete other direction that you train in such a way where you use things like yogic nasal breathing. There's more and more coming out on this now. I've done podcasts and one of the chapters on the books all about if you breathe correctly, all should be done through the nose, deep diaphragmatic breathing. You employ what's called ujjayi pranayama breathing. It's an ancient breathing technique that you get rid of the waste products It actually connects mind and body because the oxygen or the prana, the life force goes straight through the top of the nasal septum, straight to our brain rather than in through the mouth. You know, mouth breathing in sport, (sighs) lightheaded, dizzy, lactic acid creation, heavy muscles. We need to recover more. So Ayurveda is basically removing or reducing the stress in the first place so we don't have to recover so much afterwards. And if doing it in the right way with the attention on the body, so we use the mind to actually move the prana or the chi around the body, like in a lot of the ancient martial arts, we actually connect through the breath, the mind and the body. We actually create higher levels of performance without the stress, so we don't need to recover as much. So the actual purpose of Ayurvedic exercise is to get you in the zone. That's the purpose to get in the zone every time you exercise 
so it's not just a once in a lifetime random sort of thing. So that's my left field answer. I love it. And we <laughs> no no, I absolutely love it because we've talked about it numerous times of getting into the zone or the flow state and the rise of Superman's a great book by Stephen Cutter. And yeah. It's one of those things like two a week ago, last week, when I went to do a clean and you know, the a weightlifting movement. I felt like I was in the zone. It was effortless. It was absolutely yeah. effortless. I PR'd everything. I PR'd every other time I was going into it. And today I went into doing my cleans and I was just trying to find the zone. I was just trying to find yeah. that state of flow <laughs> of finding that movement or that correction that could put me in the state the state where it's absolutely effortless with what I'm doing, because you're hundred percent right. When we do something effortlessly, we don't exert the same amount of exhaustion that we would in a normal state when we're pushing ourselves to that limit. So what would you say to the people that do have to practice like CrossFit, for instance, I would say rugby or soccer, because there are times where you just can't find it. You just can't find it, but you still have to put in that time and that effort. Would you say go to a lower impact training, such as a skill training where it's very low impact on the body? Or would you say go more on the cardio side where it's low impact on the mind? Yeah, it's a great point. What I would recommend is basically what I did back when I was playing professionally. And that is, it is not a environment where it's always conducive to get into that state. So two key things. One is when you're in the competitive phase, rugby, soccer, deadlift, whatever it is, then extend the warm-up. So because that's the warm-up you have control over. You can determine the intensity and what you do. And always try and use an activity that has a regularity to it, some sort of routine or consistency. So walking, jogging, cycling, consistent activities. And that's more in training for the mind. Okay. But so use the warm up. So extend the warm up so that you can have a more longer, more gradual increase to the intensity you need to compete at. Once you get into the com- competition phase, I would suggest just let go. Don't get too in the head about your, tra- as we know, the paradox. The more you try and get into the zone, the less chance you're going to get into it. Once you're in competitive or performance, just do it. Don't worry about whether you're stressing your body or anything. Just perform as best you can. And then in any break, so in a rugby or a soccer, for example, in between deadlift sets or whatever, come back to the breath. And so you use this deep diaphragmatic nasal breathing. Search Ujjayi Pranayama. I'll give you some resources at the end. People can use this sort of ancient technique. And what it does is it basically activates parasympathetic nervous system. So you can calm the heart rate, calm the breath rate a lot quicker, use a sort of a more controlled exhalation where you use the diaphragm to get rid of the waste gases a lot quicker. So you can actually get things back into a more calm zone state a lot quicker. And then at the end of the performance, then again, you have a nice extended cool down where you again come back to the nasal breathing and just really start to get rid of all those waste products a lot after the session rather than using the needing the ice baths or whatever to do that for you. So uh, that'd be my recommendations. Yeah, no, I mean, that that makes perfect sense. And I I love it. Like, I mean, it, it sucks because you're right. Like when you try to get into the zone, you just push yourself further and further away from it. And I've fallen into that (laughs) trap so many times. Recently, there was a baseball game, this pitcher, you know, I I ate him alive. I mean, you know, I hit a three run homer off of him, and I was just roping the ball. Uh, And then I faced him another time and I was like, all right, come on, you got to get in gear. And then he struck me out twice, you know, And and it was just like, what happened there? And the only thing that I could tell that happened is I was trying too hard. I had too much of a conscious effort in what I was doing. And you talk about the consciousness. You talk about consciousness a lot also. So can you explain being conscious and being in the moment versus kind of coasting and having it in autopilot? Yeah. So it actually links in beautifully to the last question as well, because in Ayurveda, as I said, the, the greater paradigm or the framework of what we're here is to develop or cultivate what we call higher states of consciousness. So what is a higher state of consciousness? Well, most people in the world today, 99.99%, we live in three states of consciousness. 
During the day, we're in waking state of consciousness. We go to bed at night, we go into sleep state of consciousness. We have some dreams, we're in dreaming state of consciousness. We wake up the next morning and we just repeat the cycle. In Ayurveda, and for thousands and thousands of years, they've had an understanding, the great, what they call rishis. The rishis are the the seers, the seers of reality. You know, we call them the enlightened saints or the yogic masters who have this gone to a different realm, if you like. And what they've been able to do is to enter or access a fourth state of consciousness, which we call transcendental consciousness or pure consciousness. So in these traditional meditation techniques, and I heard a recent podcast of yours where you're, I think, speaking with Meg about different meditations and they're all good, they just do different things, totally agree. So traditionally, meditation was not to think about something, it was actually to go beyond the thinking state of consciousness. And that is where we actually experience the self, the essence of who we are, the non-physical state of ourselves, which is eternal, it's universal. And what science now shows is that if we can experience that more and more each day, then we start to bring those qualities of silence, broad-ranging thinking, calm, bliss into activity. And so the fifth state of consciousness, I'll answer the next question in a moment. So we develop over time a fifth state of consciousness. And Mahashi, who brought TM out, calls this cosmic consciousness. And that is when the fourth state, subjective state of bliss, unbounded awareness, we're completely settled in the self, is together with activity. And so it, in a sense, is a permanent zone state. We're always in the zone, whether we're having a meal, we're asleep, we're dreaming, we're playing baseball or whatever it is. So that's the underlying answer to all these questions that we transcend each day while we're in life. And then over time, we evolve that these high states of conscious become permanent and we're always in the zone. That's the ideal. Wow, man. Wow. That's <laughs> I'm not a, there yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's a heavy answer. It's a great one too. I mean, that's, it's so true. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad like you listened to that part of the podcast because I think that was the one point I really wanted to drive home in that podcast is everyone's different. And I love when I get people that say, dude, I'm trying to meditate. I'm like, dude, you shouldn't be trying to meditate. You know, it, <laughs> it should be something that's effortless. It should be something that's easy. And I knew I was doing something wrong when I tried to take up meditation. And it was this, it turned into a chore. It wasn't something that was easy going. Whereas if I'm throwing a ball against the wall, I get in the zone and I just have this clarity of thought that is like no other at certain times. And it could be any time where like, you know, I'm, I'm working out and I have thought clarity. That to me is my source and mind frame of meditation for me. Whereas other people think it's the bear in the cave. I love how some people are like, no, you got to think of, you know, you're in a desert. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't think these Shaolin monks were thinking they were in a desert. They have a step up on us in that perspective. And mental clarity, I mean, that comes with age and that comes with longevity. Do you have any stories about that with the mental clarity side of it, especially when it comes to meditation and finding yeah. that Zen, so to speak, later on in life? Yeah. Well, just before I get to that, there's a famous story, spiritual story about exactly what we were speaking about, about the student. And he goes to the master and he says, master, can you teach me the ways to enlightenment? And he says, yes, certainly, certainly. And he says, master, how long will it take? And the master says, take you 10 years. He says, no, 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 I'm in a hurry. I haven't got 10 years. You know, could you, you know, teach me some other way? I'll work really hard. I'll work day and night. How long will it take? The master says, 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, so it's an effortless path. So yeah, the mental clarity side is, don't want to keep coming back to this, but this distinction, and it's interesting, neuroscience just in the last 18 months has studied meditation. What they've shown is that there's three distinct types of meditation. So when you put the electrodes on the brain and you can actually measure brainwave activity, e.g. coherence and all these sort of things with different mental practices. And so what they've found is that there's three and they have different correlations to mental clarity and zone states and all these things. And the first one is focused attention. And this is what you're talking about. You know, there's different ways we've thought about meditation. You've got to focus on the candle flame or we contemplate some flowery, amazing thing. But this is a bit like we're paddling on the surface of the water. 
And so the mind is still active. And so traditionally, that's what meditation really focused on. What we're moving towards now very much is more this mindfulness states or we're more passively aware of our thoughts, but we're not trying to force anything. We're not trying to try to meditate. We're just observing the thoughts. And so what the science shows is this creates a much more Calmer state within the physiology. We can often reduce pain in this state, less anxiety. Really, really good. And then there's a third stage, which is like I've spoken about transcendental meditation, where we the goal is actually not to be thinking about anything or to observe thoughts. You use a mantra or a sound, and a sound obviously has a certain vibrational resonance, which allows the mind to actually go beyond the thinking process completely. And that creates a third state of physiology and a different sort of brainwave thing. So as you're saying, it's not one or the other. It's like a toolbox. And I always use the analogy of physical training. You know, 20 years ago, most people did cardio. You know, that was to be fit. You'd go for a jog or you'd go for a run. But we now know over the last decade or more, strength training is absolutely critical to physical health. Flexibility, yoga and stretching is also really important. So it's not that you just do one of the three. You need to do all of the three. And it's the same with mental training. You know, different people have different body types, but something in each of those three areas is really important for for good mental health and mental clarity. Makes sense, man. I mean, having a balance in life is so important and so crucial. And you get people that go one way or the other, and they don't find that balance in the middle of it. And I think the fitness industry is the best example, in my opinion, of people that don't branch out into different studies. It's like, it's my way or the highway. And then you get the trainers (laughs) and the coaches who their egos are so big (laughs) that they are reluctant to try (laughs) new things and understand new modalities that could actually help them and help their clients later on. My last question is, I'm going to circle back to the recovery thing. So if you get the people that don't buy into what, what we've said, and we're going to have those people, those listeners, what methods would you prescribe, not prescribe, but what methods would you recommend from an Ayurvedic perspective? Would you recommend an ice bath as being your number one, two, and three? Or would you recommend heat, ice, more movement? Or would you recommend sleep? Because we know sleep has been widely addressed lately. And to be honest with you, I perform better with less sleep versus someone that performs better with more sleep. So what would you say are the best methods for that recovery state to get your body in the optimal position to A, retain information from your training and B, exert maximal effort? Oh, because I'm conscious of trying to add something to the conversation, I would, two things I'd say. One is from an Ayurvedic perspective, ice baths can have phenomenal benefits for this post-recovery phase, but there is a but, and that is a caution just in terms of body type. Without going to body types in detail, most athletes in Ayurveda have what's called a pitta predominant body type, which is a heat-based body type. The reason they're an athlete and they want to compete is because they have their fire. You know, there's a fire to them mentally and physically. They're driven, they're motivated, they want to compete, they want to get a personal best. So for them, cold is a good antidote to that natural heat they have. And inflammation, we know, has a lot to do with that sort of heat based or that fire tendency. But people who are slightly outside of that high competitive phase will have a different body type. And the other two body types are actually really sensitive to cold. And so ice baths for certain people from an Ayurvedic perspective can be absolutely disastrous. You think of most people, you know, Wim Hof is a classic fire body type. Tim Ferriss, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Anthony Robbins, Ariana Huffington, nearly every motivational speaker, self-help guru, their fire, their passion. And so that works for them. And athletes, it'll generally work. So I would, I would, I'm happy with that as a recommendation. But just for those who are a bit more, say, recreational, listeners that are more recreational that maybe don't have that body type, be a bit careful with severe sort of ice bath recovery. In answer to you, I'd go for sleep, but I would put an Ayurvedic supplement to it. And that yes, sleep in Ayurveda is considered one of the pillars of health and well-being, perfect for post-training recovery. But I would just add the point about trying to make sleep, if you're an athlete or you're trying to recover, as early 
in the night as you possibly can. Ayurveda understand that there's six four-hour cycles that the body goes through every day. So every four hours, the body is transitioning into a different physiological function that it's trying to perform. From 10 p.m. at night to 2 a.m. in the morning, with a slight variation for where in the world you are, the laws of nature, that's the body when it's at its peak for recovery, for detox, for getting, you know, repairing muscles, kidneys, everything, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. So if people can get to bed at 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock, 10.30 sort of thing, you'll get maximum use of that wave. And that's where most of our recovery comes from a natural perspective. That's when the body's designed to do its recovery. So getting to bed at midnight or one in the morning, two in the morning, having the same amount of sleep is different. That's what the key of Ayurveda. It's not just how much sleep we get or how much calories, it's when we get them. Are we doing it in tune with when the body's natural cycle is or are we going against that cycle? So that'd be my little tip to just Early to bed, early to rise makes a man, a woman, healthy, wealthy, and rise and recover better. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. I wish we talked about this and it just, it, it, you just brought it up, supplements. And real quick before we go, and we'd love to have you back on, besides supplements, what's like the forgotten fruit or the forgotten herb or something that we tend to neglect nowadays in modern society that we're not taking or we're not, you know, ingesting as much as we should? I actually thought of this one in your previous last question. It's not a single herb. We also had this joke at my dinner table because in Australia we say herb and in America my partner, she says herb and I think you said similar. So, But there's, I'd get people to research something called Amrit, A-M-R-I-T. Amrit Kalash, K-A-L-A-S-H. In Ayurvedic medicine, there's an understanding of what's called Rasayanas. A Rasayana is something that builds up the body, helps it repair, and what they call the king of Rasayanas is something called Amrit Kalash. It's a combination of herbs or herbs um, that we now have as a supplement. And when I was thinking about my research way back in the day, which is exactly that, overtraining athletes, how do we get them to recover through antioxidant supplements? Some studies show 100 times more powerful than vitamin C, vitamin E as antioxidant scavengers. So highly recommend it for athletes, um, even people with serious disease. They've shown really, really, really powerful. So that's the thought that I came. Amrit Kalash, check it out. Be um, bought from most places around the world So uh, online. So it's a good one. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Loved having you on. The information is just overwhelming, to be honest with you. And so glad we got you on here to explain what Ayurvedic medicine was because we've never had anyone on the show so far. So thank you so much for coming on, man. Absolute pleasure. It's a great podcast and it's been a treat. Keep uh, getting out great information. You're doing a great job. Thanks, man. And how can people get in touch with you? Um, You have books that are out there. What's the best method for people to stay in tune with you? Yeah, no, if they go to my website, Mark Bun, that's B U N dot com dot A U, they can get everything there books, podcasts, I'm doing a lot of talks internationally now uh, with video conferences and all that sort of webinar stuff. So, markbun.com.au dot com and uh, yeah, happy to help. Awesome, man. Thanks. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. You can also find us on Instagram at The Project Kuwait. Thank you, and join us next time.